my name is Shauna Sylvester and I serve as the Executive Director of Carbon Talks here at the Centre for Dialogue. I want to welcome all of you. Uh, I want to say a thank you and acknowledgement to uh, the North Growth Foundation and the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions who have helped us host our Carbon Talks. Um, and I'm really excited to see you all here today. It's great. How many of you have been to a Carbon Talk before? Oh, most of you. That's good. So you know our format. Uh, we have about 20 to 25 minutes where our speaker speaks and then we really open it up to dialogue and a chance for you to ask questions. So keep track of your questions. If you're watching us through Twitter, please tweet us today at Carbon Talks. Uh, and then you, we also have a hashtag BC Transpo as well. You can look at that as well. So please Twitter if you've got your Blackberries. We don't consider it rude to be plugging away at your Blackberries or your iPhones. I guess who has a Blackberry anymore? I, I still do. <laughs> Few of us do. Um, I'm excited today because you know there are people that you have heard about and you you know, I think there was, what, 20 years of my life that Rob Abbott's name would come up in each and every other circle. But ironically, I don't think Rob and I actually formally met until about a year ago. Is that true, Rob? Rob has been working in the business and sustainability field for years and years with, at the head of Abbott Strategies. And, um, and he was certainly a leader that I had heard about even in the early 90s. Okay, I'm, I'm dating myself. Actually, I could date myself many, many more years before that. And then Rob uh, took on the role as the Executive Director of Carbon Neutral Government and Outreach with the province of BC's Climate Action Secretariat. And he has actually got 20 years of experience helping government businesses discover wealth creating opportunities through dialogue, integration of sustainability, and organizational and competitive strategy. Um, this is from Rob's bio, and I wanted to read it because I think it says a little bit about you, more on a personal <laughs> level. Rob is passionate about the intersection of sustainability with strategy and innovation, the ways in which trust, self-trust, relationship trust, and organizational trust must be created to enable the collaboration that will create communities that are low carbon, healthy, and resilient in the face of change, and meaningful engagement of the three types of innovators necessary to achieve broad systemic change, disruptive, bridging, and receptive. Rob, it's great to have you here, and we're looking forward to having 20, 25 minutes of your brilliance. <laughs> Thanks so much, Shauna. I, I've got a lapel mic on. I just want to do a quick uh, sound check. Everybody can hear me OK in the room. So a couple of caveats, because that was a lovely introduction. And I, I hope to, in some measure, deliver on those good words. I just also want to acknowledge that I am here to a certain degree as a, as a provocateur. Uh, it's great to see some familiar faces in the audience. It's also great to see some new faces. Uh, I recognize there are some folks in the audience who have considerably more transportation specific expertise than I. And my hope is that I can open up a space through my remarks that allows us to have a conversation that matters. Because transportation, as all of you well know, is the single largest segment of the CO2 pie in a provincial context. The choices we make about land use and transportation, and really you need to couple land use to transportation or any conversation about sustainability, is a moot point. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a few moments. But I really want to open the space for a conversation such that we can begin to step into something that can be a jumping off point for a really, really rich conversation that's going to unfold tomorrow at the SFU Center for Dialogue on Mobility Pricing. And I encourage as many of you as possible to attend that if you're able. And of course as well, uh, and then I will really genuinely get started, I'm, I'm talking about how we might reduce transportation emissions in a provincial context. But I'm having that conversation from a, a, a patch of earth in Metro Vancouver. And it deserves to be known and named that Metro Vancouver for many years has been making strategic decisions, decisions that reflect pioneering work from the 1970s onward, decisions that align with a regional growth strategy <coughs> that I think is arguably one of the finest pieces of sustainability planning you're likely going to see. And so it's a real privilege to be here with you such that 
we can draw as many of you into the conversation in 20 to 25 minutes as possible because I have some things to say that I hope will provoke you, interest you, intrigue you. I also know that the body of expertise in this room is considerable and hopefully we can tease out some of the things that deserve to be investigated further as we work towards reducing transportation emissions in the province. So without further ado, let me just give you an overview of where I want to be going uh, at a relatively high speed. And I'm not going to dwell on some of the background that I know you have encoded in your DNA or in your bones. So I want to give you a little bit of background and context, but briefly. I'm going to give you the story at a glance as I see it and increasingly experience it on a provincial scale. We'll talk a little bit about BC transportation emissions and fundamentally we'll talk about what I see as the need for a holistic or portfolio approach. Uh, there is no silver bullet here. Uh, we need to be thinking about natural gas as fuel for commercial and light trucks. It's an arrow in the quiver, so to speak. We need to be acknowledging the renewable and low carbon fuel standard that we do have. We need to talk about urban transit. We need to talk about car sharing and a variety of related things. What I'm most interested in, and I know this is going to provoke some discussion, is the whole question of transit-oriented development, including transportation affordability. And I want us as well to acknowledge the convergence with health, to pick one topical area, and the need, as I see it increasingly, to connect what frequently seem to be disconnected thoughts and ideas. Uh, I also want to acknowledge and recognize that behavior change is hard, especially in a North American context, uh, and in particular when we talk about cars. You know, as I was walking over here, I, uh, I just kind of did a casual, you know, count of the number of single occupant cars that were streaming past me on Hastings. And I also passed a couple of people coming out of a, a meeting and that reflexive response of where are you parked? You know, the, the notion of the car in North America especially is an iconic thing that is far more than mobility. It's far more than transportation. The car as a symbol of freedom, just to take one example, is a powerful thing that we need to acknowledge and name as we try to encourage people to shift their behavior. So, the story at a glance, and, and this of course is something of a teaser, but you know, if, if I look at this, I think there are some underlying principles that have an impact and that ultimately have very specific outcomes. I've chosen to flag some health outcomes here to really tease some thinking. So if we create mixed land use, obviously we're increasing walkability or the potential for walkability, we're increasing public transit use, we're increasing physical activity, and the health outcomes are improved social cohesion and mental health, decreased obesity and injury, to name just a few. And these impacts and outcomes are perpetuated as we move through building complete, compact, and energy efficient neighborhoods, which by the way is the third charter commitment under the Provincial Climate Action Charter for local governments. And if we enhance connectivity with efficient and safe networks, we get many of the same impacts and health outcomes. Now I want you to be thinking about that because too often we count investment dollars in very discrete silos and similarly we count costs and impacts in very discrete silos. So early onset diabetes, obesity, heart disease, heart death, these are typically treated as health concerns or health issues but ultimately they are rooted in decisions that we make about land use and planning. So deep background, you've all seen the most recent IPCC report. I'm not going to dwell on this. Suffice to say, as if we needed any further evidence, climate change is indeed real. The climate change we are seeing now is mostly caused by humans. It is at unprecedented levels. Now, BC has taken a number of steps towards addressing climate change. 
I want to talk briefly about the Climate Action Plan, but in particular, I want to talk about some key results to date, which we can circle back to and discuss and debate. But I also want to talk about why we need to do more and where transportation fits in. So on the one hand, yes, BC's GDP growth has been the same as Canada's since 2007, and through the recession, our population growth has been higher. Fundamentally, the message, and now I would caution that we don't want to oversell this, it's early, but greenhouse gas emissions are down, GDP and population are up. Is that the beginning of a decoupling of economic growth and economic development from greenhouse gas emissions? I wouldn't want to necessarily state that too strongly, but there are some encouraging trends underway. We do consume less coal, diesel, gasoline, and oil today in the province. There are signs of a growing green economy. And here's the, the visual. You know, we're fundamentally on track for our 2012 emission reduction target. The heavy lifting, of course, is still to come. So there is more that we can do. And in particular, I think there is an opportunity across the province to have a meaningful conversation about what a clean transportation strategy looks like, what it contains, and how we get from here to there. For what it's worth, I think there are some other things we should do too that are linked to this. You know, zero emission targets for buildings, maximizing the carbon value of our forests, to name just two examples. But I flag the buildings piece as well, because as a province, we have a lead gold or equivalent standard for buildings for new construction, but we haven't necessarily yet coupled that policy to location. And so it is that a lot of beautiful, magnificent buildings are built in green fields far removed from the core. They don't facilitate transit-oriented development and the like on a consistent basis. We need to be coupling innovative thinking about buildings with location or else we're perhaps inadvertently adding to the carbon footprint. So here's the pie chart you've all seen. Transportation, the largest single slice of emissions at a provincial level. So how do we lean into that and manage it better? Well, if we take a closer look at it, passenger vehicles, heavy duty vehicles, the big impact drivers. So what are some of the things we can do? What are we learning from some of the actions we've already taken and where might we go from here? On the one hand, there's a conversation about using natural gas as a fuel for commercial and light trucks. So there are fiscal incentives in place and it's worth knowing about these if you're unfamiliar with them. You know, there is a clean energy vehicle program sponsored by the province. There's a Fortis BC light duty vehicle CNG incentive program and a heavy duty vehicle incentive program. And you can see the eligible vehicle classes here. All of this is directed at shifting from dirtier fuel to cleaner fuel with consequent benefit. For what it's worth, the 2012 intake for the Fortis heavy duty vehicle incentive program looks a little bit like this. And for what it's worth, incentives are also available for construction or improvement of maintenance facilities for the safe operation of CNG and LNG vehicles. And the emission reduction potential, if you're tracking this, is about 20 to 30 percent relative to business as usual. So if we can shift, especially from diesel, we're realizing an improvement. Now, if my friend and mentor Bill Reese were in the room, he would say, Rob, you're simply talking about becoming less bad. And I would agree. I would agree. I would also suggest, however, that this is a step. It's a micro change. The key question and what I want to engage you on is, what do we do next? What are the options to build off of this? The Renewable and Low Carbon Fuel Requirement Standard, not terribly sexy, but it's one of the core actions in the transportation sector under the Climate Action Plan. If you haven't tracked this, the key features of it would be a 
annual average renewable content in gasoline, a 4% average renewable content in diesel. Crucially, a 10% reduction in carbon intensity by 2020. So what? What might that mean? What that means is that this is a regulation that applies to roughly 9 billion liters of fuel every year in the province. In 2010, it resulted in the avoidance of roughly 420,000 tons of greenhouse gas emissions. For 2011, we estimate a little over 700,000. By the time the full 10% reduction in carbon intensity is achieved, we expect to be avoiding roughly 2 million tons per year. So it's a standard. Again, I would suggest to you that it's an arrow in the quiver. It's not the silver bullet. It's not the sole thing we can do. But across the province as a whole, it represents something that is having an impact. Uh, state of the market for liquid fuels, I think this is reasonably well known and I don't want to dwell on it such that we can get to the questions and discussions quickly, but ethanol and biodiesel are now relatively common, well established. The maximum possible carbon intensity reduction with these renewables is limited by the 10% ethanol and 5% biodiesel warranty limits. So there's an ongoing dialogue with automobile and truck manufacturers in terms of the warranty provisions for engines and the evolution of those engines. Cold weather performance of fuels and as a result producers need to respond in a variety of ways and we're having conversations with them. There is an unknown demand for flex fuel and higher level blends of biodiesel in the province today. In terms of alternate fuels or what we characterize as alternate fuels, Natural gas has the potential to reduce carbon intensity by up to 30%, but I wouldn't oversell that. 20% is probably more accurate. Electricity in BC has a low carbon intensity, so to a certain degree in targeted locations, electric vehicles do make sense. Hydrogen can be captured as a byproduct of industrial chemical production and manufactured from wind power and can be very low carbon, but of course there are other issues associated with hydrogen as has been discussed quite a bit in the Vancouver Sun and elsewhere recently. And all of the above are really just entering the market. None of them are transformational. Expansion of urban transit. So if we think about what we can do with natural gas, what we can do with policy tools like a renewable and low carbon fuel standard, those are individual arrows in the quiver. This is another urban rapid transit. So we have a $14 billion transit plan. A key plank of that is the Evergreen Line. It should be in service by the summer of 2016. Roughly 110,000 people are using the Canada Line each day and we have seen a modest bump in BC Transit passenger trips over the last year. It's modest. And I think the, the, the point I would put to all of you and that I would like to talk about is this. We not only need an expansion of rapid transit, we actually need to make it attractive. This can't be something that we, that we use because we are feeling virtuous or because we want to make a contribution. It should be those things too. But we need to make this something you actually want to take. <coughs> Car sharing. Vancouver is actually blessed with a rapidly expanding network of car sharing. Modo, 9,000 members. City of Vancouver has nearly 600 staff signed up. Car to go. Uh, I, I think there should be a friendly competition between Vancouver and Calgary with respect to car to go. It's been remarkable for me to track how fast the uptake of Car2Go in Calgary has been. It's actually been Car2Go's fastest uptake in uh, North America. Zipcar and uh, Victoria has the car share co-op, a very modest uh, incursion in Victoria so far. But car sharing, part of an interesting mix. You know, if you begin to think in terms of walkability, cycling, 
car sharing, use of taxis, rental options, and so on. For many people, this actually becomes a much more viable option. And certainly something that I and others are tracking is what I would characterize as the under 25s. You know, people across North America under the age of 25 who are either not getting a driver's license or who have a driver's license for professional or other reasons but have no desire to own a car. And increasingly, this is something that I think actually has real merit and is worth tracking. And we'll talk about that, I'm sure. Uh, Transit-oriented development. This, to me, is the big one. Uh, this underpins so many of the other things we might talk about with respect to transportation emissions. So transportation affordability needs to be a planning goal of equal or greater importance to congestion reduction. I believe that passionately. And I realize that in a Metro Vancouver context, that is either precisely the objective, or we might well say, gosh, that train left the station a long time ago. But the reality is that with with property values in the city of Vancouver where they are, the city has sprawled for a variety of reasons. But making transportation and transportation options affordable and really understanding what that means and what the consequences of that done well and not done well are is absolutely vital. So transportation affordability. Planning decisions need to consider their effect on transportation and housing affordability. Affordable modes of transportation, well I've talked about some of this, walking, cycling, public transit, need to be supported by applying a philosophy of complete streets. You know, let's think consciously, and Vancouver and Metro generally have done some of the pioneering thinking in this, I realize, but understanding provincially how we make the road network more than simply a network for cars. Car sharing, we've talked a little bit about that. Smart growth and transit-oriented development that reduce the distances that people must travel to reach services and activities. How many of you read uh, Bob Patton's opinion <laughs> editorial this morning in the Sun? You know, he, he talks about, really, really? You know, Bob talks about this and he talks about it well from the standpoint of saying, let us imagine Metro Vancouver 30 years in the future. You know, imagine Metro Vancouver with one million more people. Where are they going to live? How are they going to move themselves around? How are the goods and services for that expanded population going to be moved around? We desperately need transit-oriented development, intelligent transit-oriented development. And this really lies at the heart of the third commitment under the Climate Action Charter. What does it mean to build a complete, compact, energy efficient community? What does it look like? How is it materially different from the communities we've seen evolve over the past 20 to 30 years? We should consider reducing or eliminating parking requirements and encourage parking unbundling. And we should encourage stores to offer delivery services. We need to be as creative and innovative as we possibly can in thinking about this. Yes, I realize that we do need the billion dollar infrastructure investments. But alongside those mega investments, there are a variety of smaller behavioral strategies that need to be deployed. And we need that mix because behavior change is hard. I spend as much time with behavioral economists and behavioral psychologists as I do with engineers and planners because it matters to me that despite abundant evidence and years of observation, we're not seeing the shifts that we need to see. So why is that? Well, in part, you know, people have limited cognitive resources. There's a limited capacity that people have for critical thinking each day. 
behavior change is cognitive energy intensive. You want someone to park their car one day a week and take transit or walk or ride their bike? Seems easy. But what's the easy default setting for that person whose behavior you want to change? People focus on the present. People have a lack of control or perceive they have a lack of control. And they will stop trying if they feel their actions have no impact or they lack the means to act. We need to connect people to the local impacts of climate change and show them how their actions do make a difference. When there are conflicting goals, climate action or sustainability typically loses. How many of you have seen the bombardment of Black Friday advertising? <laughs> I mean, come on. You know, Black Friday advertising versus, you know, mobility pricing at the SFU Center for Dialogue. <laughs> Social comparison. We see peers discounting the threat of climate change and acting on sustainability. We're less likely to act. And lack of a widespread social movement. Now, I think what's unfolding in Metro is interesting. And yes, I know it's driven in part by a referendum that's looming in the future. But people in this region are engaged on the transportation question, on the transit question, for a variety of motivations and reasons, I realize. But across the province as a whole, we don't have a widespread social movement with respect to climate action, transportation, and the reduction of emissions. I think we're making some progress. We could get there. But we do not yet have that kind of widespread social movement in part because it's not clear we understand and are prepared to articulate what it is we want. You know, people may want or say they want public transit, but they also want a single family detached house. They want the flexibility of taking a variety of modes of transportation anytime they want. Is that realistic? Is that something society can afford? So returning to the key message, healthy transportation networks can reduce species transportation emissions. No question. We need to take a holistic approach, provide a variety of transportation options. I've highlighted just a few. Build efficient and attractive road, rail, and waterway networks. Make active transportation convenient and safe. It has to be convenient and safe, and it has to be perceived to be convenient and safe. And that means, by the way, leaning in to those otherwise well-meaning people, for instance, on Point Grey Road, who are rather upset at the prospect of additional bicycle capacity. We need to encourage use of public transit, which means that we not only provide that network, but that it is seen to be extraordinary. Now, the reality of it is that this region has spent billions of dollars in recent years putting in place a transportation infrastructure that is extraordinary by many measures. The reality, though, is that we need to do better. We need to do more, and we need to do better. And through it all, we need to prioritize safety. You know, people need to understand that they can get to their destination and back by a variety of modes safely, efficiently. And active transportation options such as walking, cycling, and transit are prioritized. You know, we tend to think of these things as an afterthought. We think of bumping the modal share by a percentage or two. We need a wholly new paradigm, especially in densely populated urban regions. If I'm having this conversation in Prince George or the Northeast or the North Coast, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit more nuanced. But in densely populated urban areas, active transportation needs to be prioritized. It needs to be accessible and it needs to be affordable. And unless we combine that 
accessibility and affordability piece, we're not going to get the numbers moving to that mode of transportation. Now, I'm doing a quick time check. And I'm at time, as Shauna has just reminded me. And I think, in fact, yes, I'm there. So now the real fun starts. Yeah, this is where the dialogue begins. And uh, I'm hoping that there are some good questions coming out. So who would like to begin the questions? OK, we're going to take one, two, three. I have a feeling there's going to be a number of questions. Like, can you take notes? And we're going to hear all three questions, and then we'll go to you. Would you like to just say your name? Sure. I'm uh, Tim O'Macken, a local sustainability consultant. Uh, the issue of accessibility, affordability, double-edged sword, we need more transit. Who's going to pay for it? It's political suicide, it appears, to raise transit fees. But from your perspective, how much can you raise fees and uh, not be kicked out of office? And how much far should they go? And how do you continue to make transit affordable when the reality is you need to collect more at the fare box? Oh, hi. Um, so it's Linda Olivier, and I'm just a citizen of uh, North Vancouver District. <laughs> um, so I'm glad you mentioned um, in your talk uh, the issue of lack of control. And I think that's where a lot of people are now. Um, they're frozen because they see that no matter what good we do, um, if it's offset by... Um, uh, forces that are moving in the other direction. For example, if we um, work on transportation and we've got a government that is planning on moving uh, to start with 420 million tons of coal through our port and also millions of barrels of bitumen, um, then we sort of feel a uh, lack of engagement. So I would like to add that I think it's really important for people to engage in the political process, and I'd like to know what you think about that. Thanks very much. Anybody? Hi, I'm Richard Campbell. And you, you mentioned uh, about uh, provincial transit plan, which is great. However, there seems to be a huge hole in the provincial plans, and that's uh, transportation, uh, a passenger transportation plan uh, to get to help people move between cities and different parts of the region and the United States. There seems to be, uh, you know, we, we have highway projects, and maybe a rail option is examined within the context of that project, but it's not examined within the context of a future network linking the rail, rapid transit, and uh, perhaps passenger ferry uh, terminals now. Uh, so there, there seems to be a need for the planning at that level. Just uh, wondering about your comments on that and if the province is taking any action in that direction. OK, well, those are three fabulous initial questions. Let me, let me take them in turn uh, as best I can, uh, recognizing I could probably have an you know, entire you know, colloquium on any one of them. But on the accessibility and affordability piece, and you know, how much can we raise fees, particularly from a political perspective, without uh, being kicked out of office, so to speak? I think that's the, the essence of what you're talking about. And you know, fundamentally, uh, I think we suffer a massive failure of communication. And what I particularly mean by that is that we do not have a, a narrative and the, the narrative or the story matters a lot, I think, in this, in this particular case. And so for me, can we raise fees? Should, should we raise fees? Can we raise fees? Yes, we absolutely should. Uh, but there needs to be context. In the absence of context, we are, all of us, evaluating a discrete proposal or a discrete project at a moment in time without being able to situate it in that broader narrative. I believe passionately that if we told people the story, not a part of the story, but the story of what it means to be rooted in this place, 
how people, goods, and services can move through this place in a way that is very different, perhaps, from what they experience today, what the components of that could look like, and how we pay for it, which, of course, will be a focus of the dialogue tomorrow. My view is that people aren't reflexively opposed to paying for something. I think they're opposed to paying for something when they don't fully understand the context. And so my, my view is that whether you are an elected official or a staff person, rather than leap into the technical engineering and scientific rationale for something, or rather than doing the cost-benefit analysis, think first about the narrative around which all of those other considerations fall. With respect to the lack of control, or the perceived lack of control, uh, and, and people becoming engaged in the political process, broadly defined, uh, yes, yes, I say, we all, all of us, should you know, tap into that, that still point at our center and actually declare, this is where I stand. These are my values. This is what I care about. And so whether that means running for elected office, whether that means getting in the face of your elected officials, whether that means writing or all of the above, you know, we need as citizens, you know, if Jim Kunstler would hear, you know, he would, he would say, you know, look, citizens have responsibilities to themselves and to others. And part of that responsibility is, is being clear about what you stand for and getting involved in the process to articulate that. Richard, good to see you again, by the way. Um, you actually open up uh, a piece of this that I think is, is really important. And I don't want to downplay in any way the, the innovation that we see reflected in so many aspects of the current transportation <coughs> infrastructure, especially here in Metro. But I do think that what you speak to is the, the need and the opportunity to open up something quite different in terms of what it means to think about mobility very, very differently. Uh, and yes, the idea of not thinking so much about how many cars or trucks a particular network can accommodate, but how people, goods and services flow, and what that can look like. Uh, it, you know, it, it's akin to saying, you know, we, we, we sometimes suffer the inadvertent mistake of surrounding ourselves with engineers and transportation planners and policy people, and they're all great and do important work. But I, I think we need an infusion of new kinds of thinking to actually take us through this, this consistent deadlock we find ourselves in around some of these issues. So the notion of you know, a passenger transportation plan and what a future network could look like, I think that's entirely consistent with where we need to go. And you know, is, is, the, is the province right there? Um, you know, I would suggest not yet. Uh, but I think it's a very live conversation. So I notice there is a man up here. I'm going to go one, two, and the third. So one, two, and three. So let's just do three. And just say your name. Uh, jo <coughs> uh, John Petrie. Uh, you made the statement that uh, transportation is the largest single contributor to provincial emissions. That's simply on a production basis. I think it's dangerous to ignore the consumption basis, the embodied carbon in, uh, in everything we bring in from out, outside the area. And uh, Seattle has figures that show the, the, the consumption basis is much bigger than the production basis. So that's one thing I'd like you to comment on. Second bit, you talk about electricity in BC as being uh, hydro produced and therefore carbon free. There's an opportunity cost to using electricity in mm -hmm. BC. The big coal powered plant in Washington keeps going because we're not uh, exporting enough. If we shut down some of our, if, if we shift to electrical automobiles, we're going to need to import more. There is a limited amount of supply. So that's comment on. 
Thanks. Uh, Fred Gutala with Waterfall Group, and uh, I great presentation. Just um, being in the renewable fuel space, I'd argue that the low-carbon uh, policies you have are indeed sexy. Um, you describe them as not sexy. So, uh, And so just to comment to a slide you put up, um, you know, 100% of the original equipment manufacturers, OEMs, um, support 5% biodiesel, uh, 79 support uh, up to B20. Uh, a few are dragging their feet like Mercedes, um, and I think one other. So higher level blends being accepted, being used, um, cold places like uh, Illinois um, use above 11% biodiesel. Minnesota just went to 10% in every gallon. So um, the low carbon fuel standard doing a lot of the reductions and within that biodiesel um, quite a bit. So maybe there is room to go higher, but uh, I just wanted to put that uh, slight correction there that, um, that uh, B5 totally accepted and perhaps above that uh, more than the majority um, using it. Thank you. Okay. And we have one more question over here. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, my name is Monica Hilborn. Um, I was just wondering if you thought that, uh, and I realize this is only this is only part of the issue, but um, the flip side could be part of the discussion, which is um, encouraging uh, corporate culture shift and uh, facilitating technology development so that people have the option of not having to commute to work. Would that have any relevance to, to this? Okay. This is kind of like the flip side. All right. Uh, I'm actually going to take these questions in reverse order because I need to think a little bit more about my response to John. Um, the, the corporate culture uh, shift, as you put it, uh, which I realize, you know, extends well beyond, you know, telecommuting and the like. But this absolutely is, is part of the solution. You know, how, how large a piece I think remains to be seen. There is some empirical and anecdotal evidence to, to support this contention. But I think if we can open ourselves to the possibility of changing how we live, work, and play so that we are not necessarily in that um, default setting, as uh, behavioral economists would put it, of, you know, we get up in the morning, we leave our house and go to work. And yes, we should try and think about that piece of it and, and making that, you know, commute as friendly as possible. Actually, let's swim upstream and challenge the notion that, uh, you know, you need to actually leave your house to work, for instance. So I think the corporate culture piece has a number of dimensions to it, uh, but if we simply think in terms of that daily ebb and flow of people, it's one thing to stretch out the, the morning and afternoon commute periods and so forth and manage the, you know, the, the flow of people, but I think it's, it's much more interesting to think creatively about, well, how, how might we engage the business community, for instance, in supporting people to live and work differently and in so doing reduce their carbon footprint. So I think it's absolutely part of the, part of the conversation. Um, on, the, on the low carbon uh, uh, fuels being sexy, uh, okay, you know, henceforth low carbon fuels are sexy, um, especially if we can get, uh, you know, further expansion. Uh, and yeah, I think that, um, the notion of, you know, there's room to go higher. Uh, I can tell you that, you know, my colleagues at uh, Ministry of Energy, for starters, uh, very keen to, you know, push this as, as aggressively as we can. <coughs> so I appreciate the comment. Now, John, uh, thanks, thanks for the, the comment and the correction. I think that uh, the consumption piece, the consumption basis, and the embodied carbon in that uh, is, is utterly compelling. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen Stephen Emott's book, 10 Billion, but I, I encourage all of you to, to get it and, uh, and read it. And it's the sort of a book that you can read easily in, a, in an hour or two. But Stephen is the head of computational uh, science and research for Microsoft based in Cambridge, and you know, he, he fundamentally tackles this question of embodied 
energy embodied carbon. And his conclusion is that not only do we need to account for it in a much more rigorous way, in a much more fulsome way, but fundamentally, we as a society need to dramatically reduce our level of consumption. And therein lies one of the great sustainability challenges. How do we move to dramatically lower levels of consumption without compromising quality of life? Uh, but the, the embodied carbon and embodied energy piece is, is huge. And on the electricity piece, you're also right. Um, the, uh, the, the opportunity cost um, is, is a big one. And I think we have to acknowledge that you know, not only is there more to electricity in BC than the sort of easy default of BC hydro and largely hydro-based electricity at historically low rates relative to the rest of the continent. Uh, the fact is we import uh, a variety of sources of energy in addition to the hydro-based. And through strategic choices and decisions that we make, we may inadvertently be causing impacts elsewhere if we're perpetuating the use of coal-fired power, for instance, over the border. So I think looking at um, the comment I made about uh, electricity in BC being, I think I said low carbon as opposed to no carbon, but uh, nonetheless, the point's a really good one, that we need to think about the embodied uh, carbon and the consumption, and we need to think about the way in which choices we make here have knock-on effects elsewhere. Okay, next three questions. Well, there was one there. Go. I'm going to take these three here, make it easy, and then I'll come over to that side. Hi, Rob. Nice to see you again. Uh, my name is Claire. How can you reconcile the Climate Action Secretariat's goal to create complete, energy-efficient communities and the province's investment in the $3 billion Massey Tunnel hi and highway overhaul and other road infrastructure projects? Remember that one, Rob. Thanks, Claire. <laughs> My name is Colin Lachlan. I'm with a company called Co Logical Carbon Solutions. <clears throat> uh, I just want to remind everybody that Vancouver is a port city and port growth in terms of transportation is, is uh, obviously growing very quickly. Uh, by the port's own landside um, data, it, it uh, forecasts an increase that will double uh, CO2e and NOx emissions in the next uh, 15 years. And uh, I, I work in the area where I see a lot of uh, growth with regard to um, drainage uh, throughout all of southern Richmond, along the Fraser River, go through uh, Surrey. You've got new plants, uh, new roads. Uh, truck traffic is, is becoming incredible out there. Uh, what can you do by way of addressing the kind of activity that is required for port growth without making it appear that you're pushing against uh, other segments in society who are trying to do the carbon reduction. Is that a clear question? Yeah, no, I think it's actually not unrelated to Claire's question as well. Okay. And the third question, that's all right here. On a lighter note, <laughs> um, my name's Cheryl Cameron. I'm from West Vancouver. But uh, just getting back to just um, sort of practically um, looking at our, our transportation locally on the Lower Mainland, how much do you look or does the government study other cities, say Scandinavian, European cities, where things are being done so much better? Um, can we not learn a lot from the way they're doing things? Um, just even as simple as what they've done to encourage bike traffic and so on. I've decided not to answer any of those questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, I'm going to take them in reverse order. So Cheryl, I'll begin with you. Uh, it, it's, it's easy to look around and kind of you know, beat ourselves up. And to be sure, we've got real issues that need to be addressed. But you know, Vancouver has uh, an embarrassment of riches 
intellectually in this space. It really does. Uh, and I think, you know, there's, there's times when we say that, you know, the PR department at City Hall is unbelievably effective and has this kind of image of Vancouver and whatnot. But the reality is that that image is rooted in truth. Uh, and many of the transportation planners, sustainability planners, land use planners, and others uh, within the city of Vancouver proper and within metro region uh, do uh, look to a variety of other jurisdictions, uh, and notably the Scandinavian countries. In fact, I had, uh, I had a meeting earlier today with a couple of colleagues from Metro Vancouver, one of whom just returned uh, from Sweden. And so there, there is an ongoing dialogue, for lack of a better word, although it's probably the appropriate word here, um, in terms of, okay, what are, what are the inspiring or effective examples elsewhere? And crucially, would they work here? You know, it, it's, you know, it's one thing to look for inspiring case studies elsewhere, uh, but then we have to ask ourselves, you know, is it transferable? You know, do we have the... Uh, the comparable set of conditions that would allow that to, to take root here in a, in a good and positive way. But certainly that kind of cross-jurisdictional review happens on an ongoing basis. I'm really quite confident of that. Could we do more? Almost inevitably, but it does happen. And I think it's one of the things that has helped to contribute to the image Vancouver does enjoy as being a city that hasn't necessarily figured all this out but is genuinely engaged in a process of, of looking for innovative examples. However, <laughs> on the, you know, Vancouver as port city, and to a certain degree, uh, and, and Claire, I'm not going to give you short shrift. I'm going I'm to speak to your question as, as well. Uh, here's what I'm going to say right now, and, I, and I'm happy to, to linger afterwards and, and discuss this uh, in a little bit more detail as well. You know, Buzz Halling once said that, you know, we are really, really good at the science of parts, but we're much less adept at the integration of those parts. And I think that when you ask specifically about how do we, how do we reconcile the activities necessary to support port growth or development with other objectives, notably CO2 emission reduction or carbon risk management. I think in part it does come back to this question of are we, are we truly looking at the port in isolation and falling into that trap that we all know too well of you know, defending this because it's absolutely crucial to the local or regional economy, et cetera, et cetera. Or are we able to look at the port and the ecosystem of ideas and people around that that makes up the region? And I would suggest to you that uh, it's not that there aren't good people working for the port, but I do think there's an opportunity to get yet better at situating the, the, the port and the various components of port activities in the ecosystem and understanding better. When I say ecosystem in that context, I'm really talking about that interconnected series of systems that collectively make up the region. I think that's where there's a wealth of opportunity still. Claire, to your piece about the aspiration of complete, compact, and energy efficient communities on the one hand, and a very specific and not insignificant financially uh, investment in you know, Massey Tunnel, which of course is going to uh, facilitate or continue to facilitate road traffic. <laughs> uh, and in so doing as well, perpetuate uh, suburban expansion. Well, I'm, I'm both pausing for dramatic effect and, uh, and thinking about how to, uh, how to unpack that. Um, so, 
that particular, that particular investment is what I would characterize as a, as a linchpin investment. Uh, the, why do we have you know, development south of the Fraser? Why have we seen that outward expansion? I mean, in large part, it speaks to both a, a lifestyle aspiration for some, but it also speaks to the hard reality that land costs closer in have, have skyrocketed. Now, I think the, 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 the way in which we can begin to reconcile that is to say, okay, everyone living south of the Fraser, out there, so to speak, those communities, those communities should embody to the maximum extent possible these, these notions of being you know, complete and compact and energy efficient. It does not address the issue that many of those residents will need to be commuting into the, into the core or elsewhere in the suburbs, depending on where their job happens to be located. So I think we begin to reconcile that, begin being the key word here, by saying, all right, they're living in communities. And by the way, some of those communities out there are you know, remarkably well designed. It's, it's how we think about connecting those communities to employment nodes and other nodes that really matters. Uh, will we still need roads? Yes. Is that investment necessary? Yes. I think we can agree it's, it's necessary. Uh, can it be done differently or better? Mm, that's a conversation worth having. But I think that's how I would begin to answer your question, and I too am happy to stay behind and, and explore that a bit further. Yeah. The, the, the big evergreen line or things like that, but just the day to day, you know, we're making decisions about infrastructure improvements, spending a lot of money in, in incremental ways that yep. keep us on path to where we're going. And, and so, just what does it take to, to change those small incremental behaviors? Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be quick because I know Shauna is a stern taskmaster, mm -hmm. but it's a beautiful question. Um, so, and I think we've actually, and I say we in, in, in the sense of, you know, my, my colleagues at the Secretariat that have been working with local government in particular, I think have, have really done some, some lovely work that started to unfold this a little bit. Uh, it does take multiple levels of trust. Before we get to there, however, we, all of us, need to... Um, confront what you know, Al Etmansky you know, beautifully described at the World Social Enterprise Forum as the, you know, the stadium or cathedral of our egos. Uh, because I think a lot of us historically, and I'm, I'm guilty. I mean, I spent years as a consultant uh, where I just presumed I was the smartest person in the room and I would solve the problem. And if you were my client, you may well have thought you were the smartest person in the room. So we need to confront our egos and try to set those aside. We then need to ask ourselves some searching questions. You know, do I trust myself? And you know, am I am I trustworthy by others? And 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 that really begins to move us into an important conversation about you know, what what is my intent? Really, what is my intent? You know, what what is my agenda or motive? 
And it's only when we begin to start teasing those questions out that we can actually get into a meaningful conversation about relationship trust and organizational trust. And there's lots more to say about that, but it absolutely is fundamental because I'm telling you that we would not today have 30 plus carbon neutral local governments and 40 carbon reserve funds and a variety of innovative practices happening at a local level if we hadn't established trust and a willingness to explore things, what some people call the third alternative, you know, an idea that is bigger than what you or I individually could create. We wouldn't be there if there wasn't that kind of trust. And so for me, that is now informing a lot of the work that I want to do is, is understanding the way in which trust informs the conversations that we need to have about innovation, for example. And it's not just about innovation, but as Shauna suggested, it really is about understanding that you know, we all celebrate the, you know, the, the, the idea people, those disruptive innovators that are sparking ideas. But if there isn't a bridging innovator who can identify that great idea and translate it to the rest of the system, and ultimately, if there isn't a receptive innovator who can, who can actually receive that and implement it, we're not going to get anywhere. But all of that, I mean, how often in your day-to-day -day jobs do you talk about collaboration? We need to collaborate. We need to engage our stakeholders. It is all predicated on trust. If there's no trust, or what we sometimes <coughs> say euphemistically, if there's no social capital, yeah, but if there's no trust, you don't have real collaboration. You might have the facade of collaboration, and that's a dangerous thing. Oh, okay. I don't know about the rest of you. I have about 30 questions, and I don't know how you got through a whole session on transportation rep representing the government and the referendum didn't come up, but somehow it did in this room, or it didn't come up in this room. <laughs> Um, I want to thank you. I know that there were some questions coming in from Twitter. I apologize that we didn't get a chance to respond to those, and I know that there were several other questions that we didn't get a chance. You're going to stick around for a few minutes. Um, I want to say a big thank you to all of you, but particularly Rob for putting the time and energy into coming today and to presenting with us. And our next, let me just get our next carbon talk is... Uh, it's on Living Forests and Oceans, BC's Supernatural Climate Allies on January 23rd. So is there anything more you'd like to say about that, Claire or Kian? It's on forests and blue carbon. Forests and blue carbon. Claire has been wanting to do one on blue carbon for a long, long time. So please come join us on January 23rd. I hope everybody has a great break. I know it's not going to happen for a few weeks, but uh, we look forward to seeing you in January. Take care, and thanks again, Rob.